First thing I want to talk about are Go's struct methods. So obviously in Go you can create structs. Structs are simply just collections of different data types that you can create on your own to store data. This could represent a database entry, a user, whatever you want to have it represent. And in a lot of other languages you could create like an internal function on this or do some other stuff, but in Go what you can do is you can create an actual method where you pass in this struct as a basically pre-parameter. So let me show you what that means. So down here, I have this method called inc uh, pointer, and I'll go over why I specify pointer and value later. So the first thing with this inc pointer, over here the key syntax is this. What this is saying is that this is a method that you can call on demo. So if you have an instance of demo, you can call this inc pointer method on it, and it will execute the code in here and give the return value as normal. So it's basically just creating a function that can only be called via a demo struct. So in here, I basically just have, I'm just incrementing the counter and then returning the counter, nothing fancy. You can see how this is called up here. I just have my instance of D, which is demo, and then I can just do D.ink pointer. And then down here, I have the same thing, except I have demo as a value instead of a pointer. So the difference between these two is effectively whether I'm passing by value or by reference. In Go, when you pass something as a pointer, you're basically just passing it by value. And that means that you can actually change the underlying value of D inside of this code, and it will persist by updating the actual demo struct that you're calling ink pointer on. Versus if you call it on this uh, ink val down here, you're passing demo as a value, so you're passing by value, which effectively means that you're copying D. So the D you work with in here, D dot uh, counter plus plus, it's not the same as the one that you called it with. So any changes you make to this demo inside of here are not going to save to the original one because you didn't pass it as a pointer. So there are different use cases where you, you'd want to use each one. And then up here, I just have this basic thing to illustrate how that works. So if we just run this, go run main.go. So before, obviously, it's initialized to zero then the first one will return one. So it returns one, and then after it's one. So this is the pointer method. So I'm updating D by incrementing it and then returning it. Now for the second one, I am also incrementing this guy in here, but this instance of demo is a copy. So this copy of D did get incremented. And if I accessed it again inside of here, it would still be incremented. So if I just did fmt.println and I just put out um, D.counter, so if I print that out in here, and I run this again, you're going to actually see it's still 2. So anytime, anytime you update this instance of demo inside this method, it will retain that, but it will only stay on that copy. So when I go in here and I return it, it's returning 2. So it's returning the right value, but afterwards it's not going to persist because we didn't update the original um, demo because we passed it by value instead of by reference. The next thing I want to talk about is everyone's favorite part of software engineering, testing. Go's testing system is actually very easy to use and really intuitive once you get the hang of it. It's something I highly recommend you use in your projects because of how quick and easy it is to implement and how many dumb issues it can catch really, really easily. So to start, I just created this basic main.go and I made this sum method. Extremely trivial, obviously just going to sum a and b, 1 plus 2 is 3. Nothing fancy here. But what is neat is how we actually implement the tests. So I created to start this main underscore test.go file, and this underscore test.go is extremely important. By convention and just by go, you have to have underscore test.go at the end of all of your test files. It doesn't matter what the thing at the start is, so here I have main underscore test.go and demo underscore test.go. These are both valid and will both run when I run go tests, but they have to end with underscore test.go to tell the compiler that this is a test file. So if I go into main test.go, you'll notice that I have these four methods and every single one of them begins with test. If you have a function that's going to be executed in your test suite, it has to begin with test. So here I have test, 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 whatever. So a capital T. So, and then again, what follows can be anything you want. But if I had this just some zeros, it would not run in the test suite. So the syntax is very simple. You just create a method beginning with test and then you pass in t, which is a pointer to the testing.t object from the testing package. And then in here, all you have to do is just throw an error if something breaks. So if it executes the whole function and no errors are thrown, then it just assumes it's good and will pass the test. The only time it will uh, fail a test is if you tell it to explicitly, so that makes writing the test really, really easy. 
So right here in this example, I have sum 0, 0, not equal to 0, and then if that's true, I throw an error. So what you can do here is you just say, okay, I'm going to only throw an error if this breaks, but then if this doesn't break, it will just run through and it will work. So if we run this test case, obviously this will not be true, so it won't execute this error and it will pass the test as you see here. And um, then you can also run these tests all together via the command line. So VS Code has really nice integration right here. You can just actually click on them and run them. Or if you run go test, this will run all the tests in here. It'll run these four tests and it'll run the test in here. So the other, the last thing I want to show you is what happens when a test fails. So I have this last test here, so test should fail. So right here I'm saying um, sum of 2 and 2, if it doesn't equal 6, then it's going to say it expected 6. Now obviously this is going to throw, because 2 plus 2 is not 6. So if I run go test again, it's going to say failed. So it's going to say fest te fail, test should fail expected six so it's going to throw whatever error message i pass in here you can define what this is and you often want to pass in variables to this message to make it really descriptive so what you really should do is you should say like sum two two and get a result there and then you should say expected six got results so then you can see exactly what happened what went wrong and you can go about fixing it the last and probably most useful thing i want to talk about is concurrency Concurrency, for those who don't know, is effectively when you can call two different things at the same time and the compiler will interleave those messages, those instructions and statements together. So say I have my programs executing down the line or whatever, and I hit a breakpoint. And at that point, I'm going to call another function that's going to then be executed at the same time as everything that comes after it. So it'll spawn another thread and execute these two things at the same time. And the way that happens under, under the hood is those instructions will then just get executed one after another. So instead of going down the line, it'll actually weave those two instruction sets together so that you get better performance and you can run long tasks at the same time and run them together. So to start out, I want to do an example. So right here, I have a method with no concurrency. So I just have a generic long function call right here and a long function call right here. So it's just going to do this long function call and then do this one, one after the other. And if we run this, you're going to see it's very slow. So it has to wait for all these to go, and I have to wait for all of one to be done before two can even begin. And it takes about three seconds. So in production or in the real world, what this would often be is maybe two different database calls. You're trying to call one table here and another table here. You can't do them at the same time, so you have to wait for one before you can do the other. What you can do with concurrency is actually fix that and do them at the same time. So here I have effectively the same code, just written with concurrency. So you can go down and see it here, and if we run this again, our performance is going to be massively improved because it's running these at the same time and it cut it in half. So now we run it in about one and a half seconds instead of three. So, and that's gain from just doing these at the same time. So the actual code of how this works, it's pretty simple actually. Go is extremely, it's extremely easy to implement concurrency in Go. So the first thing I did is I created this wait group up here. What a wait group is, is it's a, a package provided by Go, which will allow you to wait for something to execute before it continues on. So I have this gate down here of wg.wait. So what this is saying is this will not continue the execution of the program down to here until, every, until this wait group is at zero, so until it's empty. So what I'm doing here is I'm adding two to the wait group. So my wait group is now going to have two inside of it. And then inside of each of these two methods, which are the concurrent calls, we'll talk about this in a second, I'm saying wg.done, and that's going to just decrement the counter by one. So it's going to remove these two things from it, and then at the end, once both of these are done, it's going to wait. And uh, if you're not aware, defer in Go basically just says this will not execute until this function is terminated. So wg.done will be called once this function has ended. So the actual uh, syntax for creating a Go routine, which is what they call them, is very simple. You basically just say go in front of a function and then write the code you want inside. So I'm saying go and then an anonymous function right here. And inside, I'm doing that same long call as above. So just looping over, sleeping 300 milliseconds, very basic. And I'm just doing that. And the main difference is that I have this wg.done, which we just talked about. And then, yeah. So this creates a very, very simple uh, concurrent way of doing these two long calls. Now, there are a couple caveats to this. The first one being, 
if you look at this, we have no idea what order these instruction sets are going to execute in. So you see here, the long call 2 did its first one before this one. So 2 was first here again, but then if we look down here for the third one, the first one ran first. So there's no deterministic way of knowing what order everything is going to run. We know that these two are running at the same time, but we have no idea when each one is going to hit different points. So if we try to do something like access the same memory in each of these functions, that's going to cause a lot of problems because they could try and access the exact same thing at the same time, which would break the program and would crash it. So there are other ways of handling that, but that gets into more advanced concurrent um, concepts like channels or uh, mutex or something like that, which I'll do in another video.